Welcome back to another episode of the House Husband Diaries. As always, I am your host, Carter C. And uh, today's Sunday, which means we're back on travels. Stories of travels. And today is Haiti. And I'm pretty sure most of you are thinking, never been to Haiti, not really sure what that's going to be about. Uh, Haiti's not known as a vacation destination, and I didn't go. If you watched last Sunday's Dominican Republic video, you know that I went right after uh, went right after the, the earthquake in 2010. So I went six months after the earthquake, and then I followed that trip up a year later. I think it was about a year later. And, uh, and so I spent about a month in Haiti, uh, post earthquake, helping doing what I could do and trying to figure it out. So as, uh, always the last couple of weeks, I've been trying to just, uh, get the subscriber base up, just a uh, little shout out, you know, those of you that, that are subscribed, thanks so much. Those of you who enjoy watching my videos and haven't decided to, uh, click the subscribe button. If you would be so kind as to click in the subscribe button, uh, just say happy birthday for my 40th birthday coming up at the end of May. Uh, it would be a super great 40th birthday present to have a 1,000 subscribers on YouTube for the House Husband Diaries. So I uh, need to come up with something that says like HHD Live. Not HD, the HHD. Uh, but anyway, so... Back to Haiti. So if you watch my video from last week, you know that we had a pretty wild experience at the border between Dominican Republic and Haiti as we were driving across. And I left you guys, uh, left off that story with getting finally getting across the border. So you, we got across the border. Basically, we just were let out of the Dominican Republic. And then we had to get into Haiti. So we go to the next gate and have to go in and get, you know, stamped in to enter into Haiti. And we were, we were late in the afternoon at this point and we knew that the sun was going to go down. I don't remember, you know, maybe five thirty six something like that. And uh, so we only had like an hour and a half ish of daylight, give or take. And I think if I'm not mistaken, it was like about an hour and a half to get from the border to where we were staying in Port-au-Prince I think. Don't quote me on that. It could be an hour and 15 minutes, could be two hours, hour and 45, but um, it was it was a decent ways. It wasn't like 20 minutes. And uh, so we so basically we got through the we got through the border and we realized that we were going to be racing daylight. And we weren't really sure if there were street lights, you know, what the situation was in terms of driving in Haiti at night in a place that we don't know, we don't have a map. As I said in the last video, I was shocked to find all of that out. So we were not really excited because we had heard from a number of people, and maybe you have, that Haiti is not exactly the safest country in our hemisphere, in the Western hemisphere. Um, it is one of, if not the poorest countries in our hemisphere. And so it's just not really a, a great place to be out, you know, after dark in a place you don't know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that, that, that goes for here as well in the U S in any city, in any town, just, you know, just if you're in a strange place, don't be out after dark without someone that knows, you know, that you trust that knows where they're going, et cetera, et cetera. So not, not anything specific to Haiti. It was just, that's just sort of common sense. You get in less trouble if you're inside after dark and not out late, you know, what have you. So we are racing the sun and we go down, we're driving and we basically lose the race. I mean, that's just, we'll just go ahead and say we lose the race. It, it gets dark. And, uh, the good news was we made it close enough to where my buddy did remember and we had some directions. And so we found the place that we were staying at downtown, the, the hotel for that first night, we, we found where we were staying and we had to drive back around 
they close all the gates, lock everything. And so they made us drive back around and they opened the gate and, and we parked and then we went in and it was like an oasis. It was just, oh, we, we felt we were so, uh, we were so thankful and so tired from that day of back and forth on the Dominican side and spending all day at the border, all of the bribery, all of the machetes and bleeding and, uh, you know, just the emotional uh, drain that we had been that we had had that day. It was it was so nice to just sit down to be, you know, in a safe hotel with other folks that were from all over the world that were there doing international, you know, humanitarian work. And, and then and then just to have a dinner and then go to bed because we knew we had to get up and start working. We were a day behind because we had spent all day at the border. So uh, we ended up staying at this place called Mission of Hope, and it's uh, it's outside. It's kind of like northwest of Port-au-Prince. So the next day we we meet up, we go out to uh, to this place called Mission of Hope, and um, and then my buddy had you know he had connected with some other people, and so we basically uh, we stayed at that place, and then and then we just met different people. We'd go out, and and one of those uh, people was uh, Sophia Martelli. And, uh, I will say that, um, Sophia was wonderful. I haven't talked to her in, in, you know, probably close to eight or nine years, but, um, basically, so I guess I'll, I'll tell that, um, well, we'll get there in a second. So basically we would go out, we would meet people and then we would, we would, you know, as we would drive through the city and be taken on, on these tours, and to different orphanages and different places that, that needed help. And we, we would meet these, these heads of orphanages and, and different you know, organizations and, and basically assess the damage. And basically, tons of people were doing that, right? You know, everybody was sending their kind of uh, forward response teams. And then they'd say, okay, like, where do you think you can help? And, and, and what are the needs? And you assess the needs. And, okay, is this uh, like something that we can get involved in and the people we know? And can we solve that issue or help? you know, ease the pain, you know, or is this going to be a, an issue or are their needs just too great and needs a much bigger organization with more resources, etc. So we, we were taken on all these tours. We saw all kinds of rubble buildings, just, you know, crumbled, uh, halfway crumbled, you know, piles of rubble in the street where they were starting to clean up. I mean, it was really, uh, it was really eye-opening, to say the least. You can see those types of images on the news. You can see still photos. You can see video rolling. But when you're actually there and talking with the people that experienced it, that lived it, I mean, it is it is definitely something um, to to behold and and, and to witness and to, and to experience. It's just uh, there's nothing like uh, just the smell of uh, of just you know concrete in the air just constantly because of of, of it, uh, the dust and everything's crumbled and then people are throwing it you know in piles and trying to cut through it and and it was just a, it was like it's like a massive construction site that's you know i don't know it was like a, it was it was unbelievable so uh one of the things that that we did was uh when we were taken on these, on these trips, you know, with the different people and they'd say, okay, well, here's our connection. And, um, and then we would hear stories about other organizations and I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to say any names. Uh, I don't want to get sued, but, um, people, UN envoys, things of that nature, uh, you know, people, famous people that would come help or that the news would say are helping. And, um, and really, it was just sort of a more of a security nightmare when those people would come into town. Uh, and, and while it may be good PR for those people, it's not really good for the locals because they have to stop working. You know, everybody has to be out of an area so that the famous people or politicians can come in and tour in safety. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's just kind of a mess. I get it. But at the same time, uh, you know, less PR. The news shouldn't run everything. I mean, less PR and more more hard work would be good. So that's my little soapbox on, on that. But um, but anyway, so we, we we basically came back 
we did a little school supply thing. We said, you know, at this point, like nothing we can really do. All these, um, all of the big ticket items were being shipped in and basically the port was just holding stuff for whatever reason. I don't know if, if it was the same kind of thing that was going on at the Haiti Dominican border where, you know, everybody just needed bribes and, and they were just making money off of it. Or I don't know what the situation was. I I never went down to the, to the port, but all of that stuff that was coming through to help, you know, was slow to get through. And part of that's the government. Part of that is corruption. Uh, but you know, part of that is, is, is just people taking advantage of the situation, which I guess is corruption. And, uh, and it's really a shame because there are a lot of good people that, you know, needed supplies and weren't really getting supplies in a, in an orderly or timely fashion. So we just tried to get some, some easy things to get through customs. So backpacks, school supplies for kids so they could keep going to school and try to keep their lives as normal as possible. And, uh, and then we set up a second trip and, and then, you know, I don't, a few months, a year later, I took a friend down and this time we flew directly into Port-au-Prince. So it was a different guy that wasn't on that first trip. And, um, and because of the people that, that I had met with my buddy from high school and that other gentleman, uh, you know, I was able to set up a number of things in that second trip and it was, it was really fascinating. So I'll get back to, uh, Sophia. So uh, Sophia's husband is, uh, Michelle Martelli. And, uh, so this is his compa, uh, presidential, uh, live CD. Listen to it many times. Thanks, Sophia and Michelle. I never met Michelle, uh, but, um, Sophia and, and, um, a couple of her children were nice enough to take us around to some of the lesser known tent camps. And so they were really big tent camps and, uh, it was kind of, it was just crazy. Everybody had lost their houses and, um, even people that hadn't lost houses had moved into tent camps. There was a lot of stuff going on in tent camps that they didn't talk about in the news a whole lot. Um, but there were really big ones that were, that made international news at the time. There's just like thousands and thousands of people had moved into these really large tent camps. But then there were also up in the hills or the mountains above Port au Prince, there were smaller tent camps that people had just kind of set up because they were their houses had crumbled in in the earthquake. And so we got to kind of go and see uh, the heart uh, of of Sophia and and our kids. And so after being taken to a number of, of tent camps and kind of you know taken around to see some of the lesser known places and sites. Um, of the devastation, we went to her house and we had, um, we had lunch and saw how they were storing a bunch of water and food and, and we were taking it out, um, and help them take out some bags to, to some of those, uh, tent camps and some of those people that, you know, weren't getting as many resources because they weren't in the large tent camps, which is where most of the resources were going. So fast forward, there's no reason for you to know this since you probably don't know a whole lot about Haiti, but fast forward about another year. And, um, you know, I got a call from Sophia and she said, well, I just want you to know, well, and let me back up. Well, okay. I'll say this. Uh, so I just want you to know my husband's running for president of Haiti. And, uh, so, so Michelle is a compa is the Haitian music and he's like the Haitian music superstar. Um, good friends with like Wyclef Jean and like whoever else. And, um, so I was like, well, okay, I don't, I mean, that's just crazy. Like what's the, like, what's the, what are the chances? She's like, I don't know, but you know, we just feel like there needs to be a change. And I talked to some other people that we knew down there and I'm like, what do you think his, his, you know, like, what are, what do you think his chances are? And they were like, well, you know, he's basically like Madonna. And if you know like anything about Madonna, Madonna was like crazy in the 80s and 90s. She was always pushing the boundaries. So apparently this guy, Michelle, was like, he was like crazy, like wear dresses on stage and do kind of, I mean, he was just, he was an entertainer. And I guess it's sort of like Jesse Ventura becoming governor of uh, Minnesota. I think that's right. And uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger becoming governor of California or something. So it's just like an entertainer that gets into politics. 
So apparently, you know, nobody really gave him a big shot, like a, a chance, probably like Trump. Well, he won the presidency of Haiti. And, you know, there was there's always talk of of corruption and, and you know, poor politics or whatever going on in, in, in a lot of countries, um, America as well. So um, so he won the presidency. And, uh, you know, I don't I didn't really keep up after a while. I think there were some hard times. Um, he was being accused by other people. And I'll say this about, about Haiti. We were driving up in, uh, kind of the mountains north of Pitchinville. Um, you know, I say north, it's probably south because, mm, southeast, maybe east of, of Port-au-Prince, but up in the mountains and it surrounds and so it really goes like flat and then straight up these these mountains but we were up there and you saw these just massive concrete houses and they were empty and they were like half built some of them and some of them were built but they were just they were just desolate they had nobody taking care of them and we asked some of our guides what what's wrong like why aren't people living here you've got all these tent houses and or tent camps and stuff and what's wrong with these places? And they said, basically, like all of the different regimes over the years, the, the cronies get all of the money. All this foreign aid goes into Haiti and they'll build these like mansions up in the mountains where it's cool. And uh, and then when when it flips, when when the next regime, there's a coup or something comes on, uh, they they basically get run out and they have to go either live in exile in like Miami or in, um, France. And so they basically just leave the country and they leave these, these, you know, gorgeous houses and, and they're just, they're like political exiles. And so they're, nobody really owns that land or they, they say they do, but then they're kicked out of the country. I don't know. It was fascinating. I mean, it was so messed up. But it was so interesting to learn to be, you know, listening to these people and, and all the struggles. And you just you just wonder why it's that difficult. You know, I mean, I get it. People are difficult and messy and greedy and, you know, egotistical and all the bad things that go on. But, you, you know, it's just it's just it's a wonder that people can't come together and say, hey, you know, like, let's work together just a little. Let's try. Anywho, so I don't really know how, uh, I think Michelle's reign as president was marred by, I don't think it was very effective. I don't remember. I, I followed it a little bit, but I, I don't know if he lost an election or if he stepped down and somebody else. Um, but, you know, they everybody accuses everybody of everything and in Haiti, and so I don't know what to believe. And I didn't go back after that second time. I just felt like after the second trip, I realized how, like, the issues that really need to be resolved are the issues that the Haitian people need to resolve amongst themselves. And they need to decide what's best for their country if they want it to move in whatever direction. And then at that point, if there's anything I can do, you know, great. But at this point, really, there's nothing that I can do. So, um, so that was just, it was really just kind of a, mm, I was in light an enlightening experience, but I think it really solidified kind of the end of my time in um, in the nonprofit realm, especially international nonprofits, is that I, I just really can't help or make the kind of difference and impact that I want to uh, in in a place where I don't speak the language and I'm not, you know, I don't live there. And so uh, for that reason, you know, it was it was a phenomenally um, good experience and learning experience. Uh, but I have two, two last stories. And, um, one I'll say we were, you know, meeting people and our guide said, Hey, do you want to come meet my dad? And we said, sure. Uh, and, uh, so basically, um, we show up at the airport, right? We land and there's this little Haitian girl lady itty bitty teeny tiny and she's like hey you know and you know whatever her name was and uh and i you know like i'm gonna be your guide for you know we got set up through mutual friends whatever so i'm gonna be your guide and and we're gonna drive you around and we'll keep you safe and i don't know how long maybe an hour into it or something i was like i don't mean to be like 
you know, uh, like whatever judgmental or anything, but you know, like you're, you're saying, Hey, we're going to be safe, but like, you're not like, I mean, are you like a black belt in karate and I don't know it? Do you, are you like an assassin? Like what, like, how are you going to keep us safe? I am a foot taller than you and probably a fair amount stronger than you. Just, just saying like, I don't know, like what I'm, I'm fill me in, you know? And I, and I, I didn't mean it in any demeaning sort of way. I just meant like, I'm, I'm confused and you're very confident. So I would like to be confident as well. And she was like, Oh, well, my father's the general. I'm like, what does that mean? The general, I didn't even know Haiti had an army and she's like, Oh no. Like, um, you know, uh, he's just, he's known in the country as the general. So I'm thinking like, the general like i don't know is there some underground military thing it's just like so now i'm in with like drug dealers and like a cartel like i i did my mind's going crazy right so we're i don't know this is like second or third day and she's like we we're in the neighborhood do you want to meet my father and i'm like meet the general like yeah heck yeah like i want to know who this guy is that's protecting us you know like the the, the boss man and uh so we show up to this place and they're like got guns they open the the they open the the gates for us we walk in close the gates behind us armed the whole whole nine yards it's like crazy so we walk in and she's like hold on he's in the office and there was all these like development projects and stuff and so we're just sitting there kind of chatting checking email something like in this office building and and she's like oh he's done you know and so we so we start walking down this hall and he comes out of his office and he's like five seven maybe like mate i don't know five eight i don't know how tall the guy was he was much shorter than what i I was thinking the general who like is the most intimidating person in haiti was going to keep us safe just by the name the general was going to be some like massive dude that you know was just like you, you know what i mean like is that not what you think too so he's like the nicest guy ever and he's like he comes shaking his hand hey hey you know his name was uh general abraham you can look him up it's crazy i'm gonna tell you about him real quick so so i meet him i don't really know anything i just know he's a general and uh shakes hand and you know i introduce myself so he says hey nice to meet you i'm whatever herod or uh, you know uh, he was so nice and I, and I said, Hey, I'm Carter. And he goes, Carter, you know, and I said, Oh, like, you know, like Jimmy Carter thinking like, uh, you know, maybe he would make the connection of, uh, of, uh, you know, a past president of the United States. His last name is my first name, you know? So I'm like, yeah, you know, Carter, like Jimmy Carter. And he goes, Oh, you know, Jimmy, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, no, sir. I don't know Jimmy Carter. Um, we just have the same. Well, his last name is my first name. And he goes, oh, Jimmy's a Jimmy's a good guy. Jimmy, Jimmy's a good friend. I'm like, oh, you're like friends with presidents of the United States. OK, like, um, all right. And he's like, yeah, yeah. OK. So we talk a little bit and he's like, well, have a nice day or have a nice time, you know, like whatever. And he's he's busy. He's got to go to another meeting. We're like, great. So then we leave go, go do whatever we're going to do. And like a day or two later, we come back to, uh, you know, check email or go eat somewhere near. And so like, we go inside the same little office building and he comes out and I'm like, Oh, Hey, you know, Hey general, like, how's it going? He goes, Jimmy. And I was like, Oh no, he thinks my name's Jimmy. And I was like, no, it's, it's Carter. And he goes, ha ha ha. I got you. <laughs> I was like, oh, this guy's so good. He remembered my name. And then he totally played a joke on me. But I don't know if that guy's still alive, what he's doing. I checked on Wikipedia. And uh, and he's still alive. If you ever watch this, uh, that was great. Appreciate it, General. Um, Or your family, anybody in Haiti that ever watches this video. uh, That was super fun. Uh, You were good people. So this guy, the General, was the acting president of Haiti for three days in 1990 and he is 
the only president of Haiti, the only Haitian president in the 20th century to voluntarily give up power. He helped with a coup, I think it was of Duvalier, and then became the acting president for three days while the country settled down, and then they voted on somebody to be president, and he voluntarily gave the presidency up. I mean, the guy's like, from my experience and from what, you know, history says, he's like the nicest, most genuine human being ever. And his daughter was like super fantastic. Anywho, so I meet this guy who I had no idea was an actual ex-president of Haiti and was joking around about, you know, having a similar name as a ex-president of the U.S. who he happens to be friends with. <sighs> I know, how do I get myself in these situations, right? And this is, you know, I mean, you talk, you talk about highs and lows, right? Haiti has, and the border with Haiti, you know, like has been like, thought I was going to die, be cut into bits by a machete at the border, and then I'm meeting like an ex-president, and then, you know, having lunch at the future president's house with his wife, even though I never met him. I mean, it was a crazy experience in Haiti. So then what I'll say, last story, and then, and then we'll cut this, uh, we'll, 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 we'll end this video. But what I would say is uh, we got to go outside of Port-au-Prince that second trip and, and see some of the other parts of the country. And the, um, we went down to uh, Jacques Mel, and then there was this place, and it's called Basson Bleu. And I don't speak French, and you can tell, but it's like, you know, the blue basin, pool, whatever. And it is beautiful. If you Google it, uh, Basson Bleu, Basin Bleu or something like that, if you're a, you know, redneck like me. So we go up. We're in, like, the middle of nowhere, these woods, jungle. We get out, and this guy, and he's, like, Haitian, so he speaks Creole, and, uh, he speaks some Spanish because Dominican Republic's right there. And then, uh, but he doesn't speak any English. And so I don't speak any Haitian Creole and, uh, I do speak English, but, um, uh, I speak, you know, a little bit of, of Spanish. And so we actually had a conversation, like a very like basic conversation in, in Spanish. So I thought it was really cool to be able to, um, talk with someone in the, in the jungle, you know, somebody who, who, who would never go to the States or, or travel much, but to be able to, to have just kind of a basic, Hey, how are you? You know, how many kids do you have? Um, that's great. You know, whatever. Uh, just like just a normal person to person conversation in a different language. And I'm not one of those people that speaks a, a whole bunch of languages that can just go around the world and, and talk to all kinds of people. But uh, I do think it's valuable to be able to speak, and, and I would love to be able to do more, but I don't study hard enough, right? And it just doesn't stick in my brain. But, uh, but anyway, if you look at Basson Bleu, it is gorgeous. And so we went up there, and you have no idea uh, what you're getting yourself into, and then you just come out on these very, very blue, beautiful pools. And, um, and what I'll say in closing is just, uh, so we went swimming and, and, um, actually met a guy from like Richmond, Virginia or something. And he was, um, I had been to high school up near Charlottesville, Virginia in that area. And his kids were like at UVA or something, or he went to UVA. I don't know. It was really, it's a really small world. And, uh, but what I'll say is Haiti is a, and is a beautiful country. Um, it has a lot of rough spots and that's mainly what the news talks about in Haiti. And I don't recommend it as like a, of, of, uh, vacation spot, uh, at least not yet. I don't know how they are with their politics. I haven't really kept up in the last 10 years or seven years, whatever, since then, seven, eight years. Uh, but, but it's a really beautiful place. I mean, it's the same island, Hispaniola, as Dominican Republic. And Dominican Republic is beautiful, and you can go to the beaches and stuff. And Haiti has the same natural resources. And, uh, I mean, I know they've cut down a lot of the trees and stuff, but, but there's still, it's still a beautiful place. Um, and they're not, there's, there's plenty of trees. I thought it was going to be completely barren. People were kind of talking it down, but I would just say that, um, you know, if you ever get the chance through an organization, what have you, um, Haiti's worth a visit. They're, they're, they're good people down there. Um, they have a lot of issues and they're trying to work through them as a country, but, um, I really, really, uh, appreciate the, the time that I spent over two trips, but about a month of my life I spent in Haiti 
and, and I really appreciate that time. So thanks so much for, for watching this episode of the House Husband Diaries. Thanks so much to all of you people in Haiti that, uh, that, that took me around, kept me safe, uh, really had a great time. And uh, until tomorrow, until the next episode, I hope you all have a great day, and we'll talk to you then.